David Goyer, the premise of your series, Da Vinci's Demons, is fascinating because you are giving us a person who is arguably the first modern man, mm -hmm. Leonardo da Vinci, at the start of the modern world, just as the Renaissance dawns in Italy and uh, everything's starting to change. Uh, take it from there. Fill us in with how the rest of this is set up. Well, um, you know, the show takes place largely in the birth of the Renaissance, which literally means rebirth. Uh, we came out of the Dark Ages and then had this great awakening, and Florence was the kind of hotbed of all of that at the time. Um, that's all where all the, if you were an artist or a scientist, uh, all this sort of inquiry was happening. And da Vinci is pretty much regarded as the, the prototype of the Renaissance man. So he was the first new man, and, and you know, one of his most famous drawings is that Vitruvian man, which people also associate with the Renaissance and with the new man. And so um, my take on the show, and the reason why the show has a lot of uh, modern photographic techniques, and the reason why the costumes have more of a graphic novel feel, and I use a lot of visual effects, is that he was uh, a man that was kind of well ahead of his time, but uh, he also occupies this unique place in the public consciousness. He's a very mythic figure. Almost everyone knows who he was or has some conception of who he was. And yet, funnily enough, a lot of our conceptions are inaccurate. So the show is its not meant to be a kind of dry historical docudrama about da Vinci. It's, it's about him, but it also celebrates the myth of da Vinci. Sorry, I'm taking my phone off the hook. So it's, it's you know, how da Vinci exists in the public consciousness. In order to do that, because he was a bigger than life character, I had to make the show bigger than life. And you make his character really big. Uh, this is, to use your term, a swashbuckler. He is cocky, brash, smug, uh, daring, brilliant, ha handsome, all of these things. <laughs> yes, so, although, although those aspects I think actually were probably historically accurate. You read his journals and he's he was definitely arrogant and definitely outspoken. Uh, he was thrown in jail a number of times. He was accused of heresy. He was known to be a very flamboyant dresser. I mean, our, 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 our general picture of him is as this old guy with a beard. Supposedly, that was a self-portrait he did in his 60s. But some historians say that that might not even be him. And you read the, you know, contemporary biographies of him at the time, and they say he was really good looking, he was almost six feet tall, he was ambidextrous, he was a good swordsman, he was a good horse rider, he was a flamboyant dresser. I, I didn't make those things up, uh, he really was that. And he was also kind of cantankerous. I mean, famously, the other, one of the other most famous artists of the time, Michelangelo, the two of them absolutely hated each other and were known to have physically come to blows on more than one occasion. So what are his demons? I mean, there are well, lots of, he has lots of demons, doesn't he, this guy? I think that most visionaries have demons. Most visionaries are tortured. I mean, I think it, it's, it's being left of center is what allows them to view the world from a slightly different perspective. So da Vinci's demons are numerous, and they're figurative, and they are literal. Um, you know, one, he was a bastard. And... That was a big deal back in those days. If you were a bastard, you were really looked down upon. You weren't allowed to join any of the major guilds. You weren't allowed to inherit wealth or land most of the time. Um, so you could become a soldier. You could, you know, become, you know, a monk or or a laborer, you know, or an artisan. So he had very he had limited options, and he, you know he was a man that that. You know, he believed he was probably one of the smartest guy around, and yet he was excluded from a lot of aspects of society. So one is his, his lineage. Uh, another demon is the fact that, you know, he can't, his memory of his mother is very elusive, and historians today don't, there's a lot of controversy over who his mother was. Some people say she was a Turkish slave. Um, he also um, chronicles this traumatic event that happened to him in a cave when he was younger, which we get into in the show. And we don't know what happened in the cave, but he, he, he drew the cave and something very bad happened. And, and we're kind of filling in those, those, you know, those questions. But also, it was, it was a very violent time. And the year our show takes place, there was this huge schism. And ultimately, you know, by the end of that year, 
Rome, which was kind of its own country, the papacy was actually its own mini state. It wasn't just a city. Uh, actually went to war with Florence and excommunicated every citizen of Florence and um, there was a lot of bloodletting that went on at the time. So how much uh, fantasy is in here? For example, uh, the plot that you tease in the first few episodes has to do with his flirtation with um, uh, Lucretia Medici. Now, do we know, was that actually factual? Lucretia Donati. Donati, I'm sorry, yes. Um, she was a factual character. She was Lorenzo Medici's mistress. Um, Leonardo certainly would have known her. We don't know if he had a relationship with her. Uh, some people say he was gay. Some people say he was bisexual. But, but many people say that he had a variety of female lovers, including the Duchess of Milan, supposedly the various um, suspects for you know, who the Mona Lisa is were you know, various lovers of his. So I think it's, it's plausible to think that you know, one of his lovers might have been Lucretia Donati. What's, the reason why I chose Lucretia, though, is because even though she's a historical figure, she disappears from the pages of history, so we don't know what happened to her. Uh, and for a creator, that's also fun because it gives us a lot of license. We, we don't know the end of her story, so we could ax her at any time. Right, right. That's, that's a great uh, blank page for you to play with. Now, you just brought up all the sexuality in this show, and it really is, a, a, I think, a nice surprise for viewers who want to be titillated. There, there's so much sex in this, in a way, and it's tastefully portrayed, but, I mean, everybody is diddling everybody in this thing, and it makes you wonder about the, the, the era back then, you know, when popes had mistresses, etc. Was the world, do you think, as sexually open as you depict it, or are, are, you, are, you, having, are you taking some liberties there? What's your view? Ironically, um, I think the world was more sexually open back then than it is today. I, I mean, I do. And even though um, you know, it, was, it was extremely common for men and, and, and powerful men to have multiple mistresses, uh, uh, many of the popes, particularly Sixtus, fathered a lot of illegitimate children. Uh, Riario was thought to have been one of his illegitimate children. and. Um, that particular pope was also known or, or suspected to have dallied in homosexuality and things like that. I mean, it was a it was a strange time because you know ninety nine percent of the people believed in in you know the church and demons and, and and most of the the people in Florence believed that Lorenzo Medici actually had an imp trapped in his ring and that's what gave him power. I mean, they actually believed that. Uh, but, you know, um, there was a lot of corruption and a lot of promiscuity. So how much CGI do you use? How much real sets? Um, because what's very impressive visually about watching this thing is that you render all of these, these minute details of daily life uh, quite powerfully. And it's obvious some of it is CGI, but where does one end and another one begin? Well, hopefully the audience won't always know. I mean, sometimes when we use Da Vinci vision, which is sort of the way that we describe sort of viewing the world through Da Vinci's prism, you know, when we slow down the birds and, and they become animated and things like that, obviously that's CG. Um, later on in the show, we've got sequences that take place in the Duomo that are entirely CG. We, we went there, we did what's called plate photography, but, but I think people will be shocked that we didn't film in the Duomo because it looks fairly realistic. But, but there are other scenes, the scenes in the papal bath, for instance, that set's almost entirely virtual. The only thing that's real in that set is the actual bath. Right. Everything else you see is digital. One of the scenes that I'm most proud of when in the first episode when Da Vinci's sketching Vanessa at the beginning of the episode and you see Florence behind her in the Duomo, that was shot in a parking lot. <laughs> oh, I love that. You know what? Something else I really like about this is uh, you pay attention to his uh, mechanical side, his inventions. And this is someone we know who envisioned uh, a future world with helicopters and tanks. And in the first few episodes, you have this plot uh, uh, point of him trying to create this repeating cannon, I guess. and uh, A machine gun. A machine gun, basically, yes. Yeah. How it, it, is that real? How, I, he did. Yeah. He did. He did specialize as a weapons um, 
person, well, and that's made him very valuable to the powers that be there, right? I mean, what a lot of people don't realize is that, that I think, you know, Da Vinci was an incredible artist and took a lot of pride in his art, but I think he was interested, first and foremost, in being a scientist and in being an inventor. And I think the way that he got the money to pursue those inventions was through art and through patronage. But I, I think a lot of the public don't realize that he, for a great long while, he derived a lot of his income from being a war engineer, uh, not from being an artist. When he was working for the Duke of Milan, it was often as a war engineer. When he was working for Borgia later on in his life, it was as a war engineer. And I, what I find interesting about Da Vinci is he, he was a humanist. He was a vegetarian at a time when that was almost completely unheard of. And yet he, you know, made his living often developing these intricate machines designed to kill people. And, and I think that's also a modern theme because, he, you know, he had to make that kind of Faustian deal with the devil in order to pursue his scientific pursuits. He had to do it in service of war in the same way that I think, you know, people like Feynman and Oppenheimer and, you know, you know, Teller and things like that had to make a deal with the devil, you know, in order to get the financing to, you know, pursue their scientific uh, pursuits. So do you believe his scientific pursuits were more important to him than his artistic ones? Because he didn't leave behind a lot of paintings. I genuinely, I genuinely do. I think he was more interested, he would have wanted to have been remembered as a scientist more so than an artist. But yet, uh, he's given us arguably the greatest painting in history, the Mona Lisa. He's given us the most viewed religious painting of all time, the Last Supper. Uh, and so his legacy probably in the public mind is more as an artist than as an inventor. And isn't it true that a lot of his inventions weren't picked up on by other people at the time? And, you know, like Ben Franklin creates the wood stove and then... and. It has a legacy. He doesn't patent it. It, be, it, ta it becomes a ma major part of, an, of a generation and the future. But a lot of Da Vinci stuff weren't picked up and adapted, or, or were they? Maybe the military things were. Well, I think w there's a couple of reasons for what that, That's true, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons is he, he didn't come from nobility. So, I, I mean, there are, there are certain ways that people look down on him because he was this bastard, because he was illegitimate. Um, I think many of his ideas were just simply too outrageous and too ahead of the time. You know, people just couldn't accept them. But I, I also think that Da Vinci was his own worst enemy, which is one of the reasons why he's an interesting character. He had this tendency to come up with a lot of ideas, but he would get distracted and he wouldn't always follow through with them. And you know, there are records of him, even in his paintings, constantly being hounded. He's, he was famous for starting commissions and finishing very few is the phrase, you know. I think he got bored really easily. I think often, sometimes, just if he had the idea, that was enough. And then he just got frustrated with society and said, screw it, I'm just going to go on to the next idea. And maybe one day, 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now, people will get it, you know. And Michelangelo did the same thing. He left behind all kinds of unfinished sculptures and the rest of it. Can you? I can't imagine them actually having the nerve to do that. Living in a world where the penalty might be getting killed because your your patrons are the most supremely powerful people of the age, who are notoriously vindictive and vicious in some cases, with no regard for human life. And these uh, gadflies like Da Vinci and Michelangelo and the rest of them go. Ah, I don't want to do that anymore. I'll move on. It's fascinating, isn't it? Well, and it, there's, there's some indication on more than one occasion that he kind of packed up under the cover of night and got out of town, you know, and, and um, I, I can't remember. There's a, there's a, a, a noble woman, I believe in, uh, I can't remember her name, in Milan who he was, he was doing a painting for. He'd done some, some sketches and the like, and she paid him a great deal of money, and he left town before he finished the painting. And... She sort of pursues him in letters, and, and, and then she writes these entreaties to all these various famous people over the course of the next four or five years, trying to get him, trying to get them to get him to finish uh, the painting, and they become increasingly more pleading, you know, of like, please, sir, could he finish my portrait? And, and he just, I also like the fact that, I like doing anti-heroes, and he just sounds like a really difficult person, you know, difficult to be around.
What do you think uh, of the uh, eight episodes that we have uh, coming up of Da Vinci's Demons? Uh, what do you think in those eight episodes will come as, a, as a, the biggest surprise to viewers about Da Vinci? Because we all think we know about him. We, we certainly, many of us don't know him on the scholarly level that you do. But what do you think is most surprising to viewers? Um, I think they'll be surprised that he was funny, which he, you know, um, he was known to be a practical jokester. Um, he liked doing magic tricks and things like that. I think <clears throat> some people know about this, but his, his, he liked being controversial and he also had a big mouth and he was one of these guys that got in trouble a lot. He was thrown in jail on a number of occasions. He was put on trial on a number of occasions and we deal with that in the first season. Um, you know, there are many times where people, even his friends, Lorenzo, Medici, they get intensely frustrated with him because he just, he just won't shut up. He just, he just gets in his own way often. And I think people will be surprised because they, you know, he's, oh my God, he's this storied sort of perfect man. And I'm, what I'm hoping is that people will relate to him a little bit in this, you know, I guess he's like House in that way or the modern Sherlock, you know, the Benedict Cumberbatch one or, you know, even, even Tony Stark. I think, I think it's impossible to have that level of genius without having a certain amount of self-destructive qualities or demons or whether it be alcoholism or, or things like that. I just think they, they go hand in hand and hopefully that's what will make the show really interesting. Now, this is a co-production, isn't it, between uh, Stars and BBC? What's, what, what's the actual setup on the business side of this? Well, they're jointly financing the show. It's a, it's a joint American and European co-production. Um, it's, it's been challenging sometimes <laughs> because, you know, I, I'm one of the sole Americans actually boots on the ground in the UK and and they've got their way of doing things, and I've got my way. And I think I first showed up, and and it was like, oh, who's this crazy American telling us, you know, you know, how to do what we're going to do? But um, it's look, it's it's worked out great. It's a long commute, I'll say that, from Los Angeles, where I'm based. <laughs> and uh, you directed the first two yeah. or three episodes, was it? I directed the first two, and I ended up doing second unit for the whole season. Um, so, and then I. I co-wrote about five of them, something like that. Okay. Well, uh, you're about to enter, you know, the Emmy, uh, <laughs> the Emmy uh, Malmstrom. You're about to enter the war over ratings. You're about to ed to be, you know, be tested by the TV critics of America just weeks away. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have the stomach for all that? Sure. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm really proud of the first eight episodes, and I had a great time making them. And so everything else is just sort of gravy, I guess. Okay, well, thanks so much, uh, David. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. Bye.